old order, new order, next order. But are the events that define my mother's life still pertinent? Do those events define the lives of her children and children? Or is it possible that we are now living completely different times? Perhaps the only good thing about our brush with the apocalypse is that it invites us to address such questions head on. The late Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was as much a political operative as a prize-winning historian. His scholarly reputation rests primarily on the multiple-part Age of Roosevelt, the first volume of which, The Crisis of the Old Order, appeared in 1957. Schlesinger's telling the disappointing outcome of the European World War of 14 to 18. Few Americans during the 20s and 30s regarded it as much of a victory when combined with the Great Depression spelled the demise of that old order, which Schlesinger portrayed as suffering from terminal exhaustion, fatigued with the higher idealism that, according to Schlesinger, had defined the progressive era. Americans after the World War embraced an ethos of normalcy. In his telling, normalcy meant conformity, complacence, and defense difference to devotees of the business cult. The prevailing national mood was drab, dull, and predictable. Schlesinger compared it to a life in sleeping in Midwestern town, the shady streets and the weekly lodge meetings, golf on Sunday mornings, followed by a fried chicken dinner and an afternoon nap. Beginning in 1933, as Schlesinger spins the tale, the New Deal, along with Franklin Roosevelt's inspiring leadership in the triumphal Second World War, inaugurated a new order that was vigorous, enlightened, and progressive. Schlesinger portrayed its domestic politics as pitting stodgy conservatives against forward-looking. What actually distinguished his new world order was a sublime ideological clarity an era defined internationally by conflicts pitting democratic capitalism against various forms of totalitarianism was all about choosing sides. The new order did not encourage doubt. Much as FDR played a key role in creating that order, it fell to Cold War presidents from Harry Truman to Reagan to sustain it. Not all of them enjoyed equal success in doing so yet leading the free world defined the standard by which they were all judged. Even after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89, the standard remained intact. During the post-war era, Clinton and Bush and Obama all sought to keep the new order alive, even from time to time that meant putting it on a figurative vent ventilator. Despite a long train of shock, including the bursting of the 1998.com bubble, a court brokered presidential election in 2000, the 9-11 attacks, the futile global war on terrorism, the devastation inflicted by Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Great Recession of 08, not to mention the rise of Trump. Political elites clung to their belief in the order. Across America, once preeminent denominations of mainline Protestantism might be in a tailspin, but in Washington, Faith that God had singled out the United States as his instrument of salvation remained fixed in place. That the parable Schlesinger had conjured up, its essentials affirmed by countless other writers, hovers in the background of Biden's foreign affairs essay of, of 2020 is then hardly surprising. Even as I write this, the American political establishment, Trump himself always excluded, clings to the illusion that in some cosmic sense, the moral and geopolitical outlook to which Americans implicitly subscribe between 45 and 89 remains fully relevant. Within days of his election to the presidency, Biden himself was assuring foreign leaders that America is back, that the conditions imparting to that period its characteristic vibe have long since vanished, somehow managed to escape notice. Belief that the U.S. is still charged with leading the free world against the forces of darkness lingers. At the outset of the post-World War II era and the most of the Europe and much of Asia laid waste and the United States undamaged but all but self-sufficient, American economic and technological supremacy was indisputable. 
sole possession of nuclear weapons guaranteed U.S. military permanence as well. The shattered and demoralized nations of Western Europe desperately needed American aid and protection. Even the former Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, looked to Washington for assistance. In the Far East, China was weak and poised on the brink of civil war. Only the Soviet Union held out against the near-global post-war Pax Americana, intent on exporting an ideological alternative to liberalism and building its own empire. Those were the circumstances that vaulted the U.S. to positions of unparalleled global preeminence. By 89, not a single one of them remained. But then, however, the conviction that preeminence had become an American birthright had long since taken root in Washington. The fall of the Berlin Wall, an event occasioning great celebration but minimal reflection, seemingly ratified the exertions and sacrifices of the previous several decades. With the passing of the Cold War, an opportunity to create bigger and better Pax Americana presented itself. After decades of conflict and competition, only a single superpower remained. Assertive U.S. global leadership was therefore more important than ever. Then, the nation possessed the wherewithal to fulfill the role that it was given. No conceivable alternative existed. Much like Schlesinger's old order in 32, however, the new order was running on fumes. The evidence was everywhere in appalling economic inequality, seemingly intractable racism, social disintegration, mushrooming personal indebtedness, budget deficit, trade imbalances, and above all, a loss of faith in the American system. For a nation deeply committed to remaining the world's leading military power, especially telling was the disparity between the munificent resources funneled to the Pentagon and the largely ruinous results actually achieved by U.S. interventions abroad, which became more frequent and more expensive as the Cold War receded into the past. But to the test, assumptions underlying Cold War expectations of the U.S. continuing to exercise global leadership and thereby defining the future, the outlook expressed by Madeleine Albright did not hold up yet. Much as Detroit kept right on calling itself the Motor City, even while bleeding market share to European and Japanese automakers, Washington remained in deep denial. In that regard, the election of 2016 mirrored the election of 32. Rather than nursing the status quo any further, the voters who installed Trump in on the Oval Office were counting on him to chart a new course. In truth, neither Roosevelt nor Trump possessed a clear understanding of which, where this new course might lead. Both presidents flew by the seat of their pets. As Inauguration Day 1933 approached, Schlesinger wrote, FDR was calm and inscrutable, confident that the American improvisation could meet the future of, on its own term. Calm was never Trump's M.O., but improvisation bordering on whimsy was to become a signature of his administration. But the troubles that swept across the American landscape during the summer of 2020 made unmistakably clear, however, was that the further improvisation wouldn't do. Trump's presidency signified the final demise of the new order. As to what will replace it, he was painlessly clueless. Candidates Biden attempt to finesse the question by vowing to restore America's position as a leader of the free world possess about as much relevance as President Trump's own mid-February 2020 assurances that with the advent of warmer weather, COVID-19 was sure to disappear. Oh, like it or not, the next order is upon us. Identifying its parameters can no longer be postponed. And that means having done with the American exceptionalism once and for all. History for the next order. To facilitate a timely transition to the next order, Americans heed the counsel of Pope Francis and recover their memory. At least with regards to race, the events of 2020 did prompt such a recovery a seemingly endless series of incidents to which 
police officers killed black citizens provoked widespread outrage that transcended racial lines. As a direct consequence, many Americans, by no means at all, rediscovered racism. As never before, white privilege now emerged as seemingly indelible stain on the nation's soul. In the realm of international politics, the counterpart of white privilege is American privilege. In American, in common with great powers past and present, the U.S. habitually asserts the prerogative of judging its own behavior on the global stage in accordance with its own preferred and imminently flexible standards. Just as the self-congratulatory domestic narrative centers on the inex inex just as the 